Good morning. If you're joining us on Zoom, we'll get started momentarily. Just going to give everyone a moment to enter the Zoom room. Good morning. Welcome to those of you joining on Zoom. We'll just give it a moment for everyone to load into the Zoom room and we'll get started momentarily. Good morning and welcome to WIDA's very special roundtable discussion on China. I am Ken Levinson, WIDA's Executive Director, and we're delighted you could join us today. Before we get to today's event, we want to be sure you know about our event coming next week as we continue our trade environment series by looking at carbon border adjustment measures on Wednesday, May 12th. You can find information about that event at www.wita.org or in the online event program we sent to you earlier today. That event is free to attend thanks to the support of our series sponsors, ISRI and Silverado Policy Accelerator. You can find, um, uh, as I mentioned, all the information about these events on our website, www.wita.org. Um, as you know, if you've watched some of our previous webinars, we like to call out the names of those of you who you are in community with, even if you can't see them on Zoom. So a welcome today to Eugene Laney, President and CEO at Ameri the American Association of Exporters and Importers. Congratulations on the new gig, Eugene. Vanessa Ciara, who's also started a new job at the American Clean Power Association. Congratulations, Vanessa. Ambassador Charlene Barsevsky, who also has a new position as Chair of Parkside Global Advisors, and Ambassador Don Johnson, Director Emeritus at the Dean Rusk International Law Center. Welcome Eugene, Vanessa, Charlene, and Don, and welcome to all of you. If you're watching this on Zoom, you can ask questions of our panelists using the Q&A tab. After Ryan gives us a brief overview of his book, we'll bring our panel on to discuss it with him and then get to your questions. I won't go into lengthy introductions of our speakers since you all have their bios, which we sent earlier this morning. But let me say what an honor it is to welcome them all here today. Ryan Haas, who served as director for China, Taiwan, and Mongolia at the National Security Council, and whose new book, Stronger, Adapting America's China Strategy in the Age of Competitive Interdependence, is going to kick off our discussion. He'll be joined after that by Amy Selico, who served as Senior Director for China Affairs at the Office of U.S. Trade Representative and is now at the Albright Stonebridge Group. John Pomfret, the author of The Beautiful Country and the Middle Kingdom, America and China, 1776 to the Present, and a contributing editor, writer uh, for the Washington Post Global Opinion section. And my good friend and frequent partner, Wendy Cutler, the Vice President at the Asia Society Policy Institute, and herself, the former acting deputy US trade representative who will moderate today's discussion. Ryan, I first heard about your book last month and as soon as I started reading it, I realized we have to have you on here at WIDA, both to share your uh, uh, thoughts with our global audience for how America should frame its relations with an ascendant China. This is an issue that we all know is the center of American foreign policy, national security, the environment, technology, global health, trade policy, and one that's impossible for us to get our arms around. That's why I'm so impressed with your book. In just under 200 pages, you're able to frame a new look, way to look at American-China uh, relationship and introduce a new phrase to our foreign policy lexicon, competitive interdependence. What can you tell us about that in the next 10 minutes? Well, first of all, Ken, thank you, and thank you to the WIDA team for, for hosting me and allowing me to participate alongside such a distinguished group of panelists and friends. Uh, it's really an honor for me to be here. I, I will try my best to be uh, very efficient with these remarks because I think that the, the real value of this uh, event will be the conversation that we have amongst each other and, and with the audience. Um, but I did want to try to briefly situate the book um, so that we have a platform to launch from for, for our discussion. Uh, the book was written during the Trump presidency, but it is not intended to be a book about President Trump. It's not intended to be backward looking. Instead, it's really seeking to be forward looking. And um, the book was completed in, in late 2019, early 2020. 
at the time that uh, I submitted the manuscript, uh, Joe Biden had just finished, I think, fourth in Iowa and fifth in New Hampshire. Uh, the, the outcome of the Democratic primary was far from known, let alone the general election. So this wasn't a book that was you know, written for uh, an expectation of any particular electoral outcome. But it was intended to try to offer a few ideas about where the relationship between the United States and China could go forward. And when the, the book was written, the relationship between the United States and China was in a pretty sharp downward trajectory. And you know, much of that trajectory was uh, driven by China's actions, I would argue. Uh, in the four years from 2016 to 2020, it's worth recalling that uh, President Xi abolished term limits. Uh, Hong Kong, uh, its character was changed. Xinjiang became an issue that, uh, that everyone in the United States has now become aware of because of the detention facilities, concentration camps, whatever words you want to use. Um, Taiwan uh, has faced growing pressure. Uh, there is no longer talk of reform and opening. Now the talk is about dual circulation to guard against hostile external forces. And we have all become aware of China's drive for technology self-sufficiency. So a lot has happened. A lot has changed in, in that time period. And then, of course, the, the velocity of the downward trajectory uh, seemed to accelerate over the course of 2020, as both countries took turns blaming the other for the downturn in relations, for the spread of COVID-19 around the world and the consequences that, that followed it. And the net result was uh, what felt like a, you know, a relationship that was pretty quickly unraveling. Uh, the relationship was taking on increasingly moral and ideological tones. Uh, there was a growing, you know, hardening view in the United States that China was an enemy and that uh, halting uh, China's progress was the goal, even if it came at the cost uh, of American interest. And I felt like this framing carried a few risks for us. Uh, the, the first is that I worried that if we were to continue down this, this path, we would find ourselves isolated and separated from our friends and allies around the world. Um, viewing China solely as an enemy just simply doesn't have purchase with any government I can think of anywhere in the world. And I'm not aware of a single country that is, uh, that is prepared to sign on to that uh, prescription. Uh, it also you know, leads us down the path of viewing countries as pawns in, uh, in great power competition, um, rather than partners with whom we need to build a common agenda to forge you know, a more productive partnership. And we already began to see this pattern begin to emerge at the end of the last administration when our Secretary of State was traveling around the world warning about uh, China's perfidy and, and explaining to audiences that had thousands of years of dealing with China, what China was and, and what it represented. Um, but also, you know, if past this prologue, there is a concern, at least for me, that inflating the China challenge would force us to mobilize at home to meet this growing threat uh, in ways that would create pressure for uh, you know, our limited resources to be increasingly uh, directed towards defense spending. Um, and there would probably be accompanied by a surge in nationalism. And, and if, if passed as precedent, then we would probably see a, a uptick in racism as well. And, and I didn't want uh, to, to stand by as these trends seem to be leaving the station. So the book is really an effort to try to offer an alternative uh, about where we could go. Uh, it does not seek to diminish the competitive nature of the relationship. Uh, in fact, I, I try to be as realistic as I can in identifying where there is acute competition uh, between the United States and China. But the book does try to leaven that competition with a certain awareness of the interdependence that exists alongside uh, the competitive dynamics in the relationship. And you know, we saw this idea of competition and interdependence coexisting uncomfortably alongside each other last month, for example, in Alaska when Jake Sullivan, Tony Blinken, Wang Yi, and Yang Gichir met, they, they had some you know, pretty uncharacteristic fireworks in front of the media. Uh, they delivered the dipl diplomatic equivalent of a few body blows at each other. And then the media left and they sat down for eight hours in a windowless room and hashed out issues spanning the globe uh, that affected both countries. I don't think they did it because they enjoyed each other's company or they held out hope that we would become friends through the process. I think it was just a cold-eyed calculation that we will be uh, affected by each other for good or ill uh, around the world. And that's part of the, the interdependence that, that I'm trying to describe. Uh, I should be clear, inter competitive interdependence is a framing device for understanding the nature of the relationship between the United States and China. 
it is not a cure-all for every problem in the relationship. I wish that I had solutions to, to all the problems in the relationship. I'll, I'll be the first to acknowledge I don't. Um, but you know, hopefully it will help us to, to recognize that there are certain issues in the US-China relationship that are zero sum, where it'll be difficult to find uh, you know, any compromises. And the best we'll be able to do is to manage uh, sharp differences between us. But not every issue in the, in the US-China relationship is zero sum. A lot of issues are positive sum or negative sum. In other words, we will both gain or we will both lose depending upon how issues such as climate change or pandemics or Myanmar or others play out. And uh, you know, our, our strategy needs to be flexible enough to be able to distinguish between those issues that are zero sum and those that are not. And my hope is that uh, this framing will help us to have a little bit more clarity and distinction uh, between these issues. The, the one final idea that I just wanted to put on the table to help us get launched into our conversation is this idea that uh, we should have confidence in ourselves and in our ability to compete with China over the long term. And I think that we do have ample reason for confidence. Uh, we have abundant strengths uh, that we control. Uh, China has notable strengths, but it also has considerable vulnerabilities. And the more confident we can be in our approach, my hope is that the more we will be able to approach China with a certain degree of calm, steadiness, and cool-headedness. And, and the more that we are able to do that, the more we'll be able to concentrate on nurturing our own core strengths, our domestic dynamism, our international alliance network, our global prestige, in ways that will put us in a stronger position for this long-term competition that I expect to play out with China. So with, with those ideas, uh, hopefully to help get us launched, I, I turn it to you, Wendy, to take us forward. Well, <clears throat> thanks so much, Ryan. And um, it's great to be back at the WIDO Zoom room with Ken and Diego. Um, I think it was just about a year ago we started these webinars and I know we've had many, you know, tons of them, but um, for this one in particular, I have to say the audience um, participation um, is, is very strong and, why not? Because the name of the book is Stronger. So Ryan, you've been very modest in five or eight minutes. You've put forward some ideas um, that um, are really, you, you delve into detail in your book, Stronger, which I read and I highly recommend to folks who are watching this webinar. And what I really appreciated about it is, you know, we're all so caught in the moment of US-China relations and every day there's so much to read and so much happening or not happening. Um, and you really, uh, in your book, we're, we're encouraged to kind of take a step back to see how we got where we are, to assess our strengths and vulnerabilities, and then to really think about what's the best path forward. And in, in that context, you put forward this, this framing concept of um, competitive interdependence. So let me turn it first over to Amy. I mean, Amy, you represent a lot of um, US companies that are doing business in China. And one of Ryan's points and interdependence is in the economic and trade and investment space, we're linked at the hip with China. So how do, how do you view this concept? And, and then how do, you, how do you then deal with this kind of decoupling effort as well? Like how do you square the circle on decoupling and interdependence? Can these two concepts coexist? Well, thank you um, very much, Ken, for inviting me to join this uh, WIDA discussion with Ryan, Wendy, and John. And thanks, Wendy, for that framing question, because I think it's just so critical to our audience this morning. I feel like a little bit of a groupie um, having listened to Ryan discuss his new book, Stronger, which I also highly recommend a number of times. It's such a useful guide for helping us think about managing all of the increasing uh, contention in the US-China relationship. Um, but what strikes me this morning and listening to Ryan give another summary and also my own reading is just the optimism undergirding many of his arguments in Stronger. Of course, that the US will and can and has self-corrected in the past in response to external and internal issues. Um, and in response to, to your question, Wendy, that. U.S.-China competition must be bound by interdependence to keep the competition within a tolerable range. On all of these issues, uh, on all dimensions of the relationship, I want that to be true, competition to be bound by interdependence, but especially so on trade. 
our companies, our farmers, our workers and consumers all want to continue to rely on the massive China market as a source of considerable, considerable global sales, profits, knowledge creation that helps drive not only our two economies, but also global growth and innovation. So I appreciate that uh, Ryan's book is diplomatic, but also pretty explicit rep repudiating uh, the recently waged trade war. He calls the attempts to unilaterally pressure Beijing counterproductive, hurting the US government and individual stakeholders more than they've hurt China. And so being ineffective in bringing about the change that again, um, we want to see happen in the trade relationship. But I think what Ryan has laid out in this book isn't just optimistic and confident as he just said, it's also practical. As, he's, as he said, it's a framework for managing the relationship where our differences and our rivalry are going to continue to be a dominating narrative. But as your question implied, Wendy, I'm concerned with policies being developed and implemented in Beijing and Washington now that continue to promote decoupling of some of the existing elements of US-China interdependence. In the short term, I think that's gonna be difficult to reverse. I hope we can end up with a relationship framed by competitive interdependence. And Ryan's book offers a good practical set of recommendations for getting us there. But I think the end goal right now of many in government in Beijing and in Washington is closer to this construct of just managing increased competition without reference to the interdependence that has served us so well, particularly in the trade relationship as a stabilizing force for broader US-China relations. What Ryan lays out is how I want the relationship to be managed. I just don't think we're there yet. I, John, I'd be interested in your views. And in particular, you know, Ryan does lay out, as, as Amy said, some like practical, clear eyed um, suggestions for moving forward. But do you think these are grounded in the political reality in Beijing or Washington now? And how do you respond to this, you know, interdependence versus decoupling? Can both coexist? Can we do selective decoupling? What does this all mean? Well, I, I, first of all, I want to thank Ryan for his excellent book. And I really, one of the central points of his book, which he, he didn't mention, given the fact that he had a time limitation, was that the best relationship we can have with China is a relationship that, that is grounded on us getting our act together domestically in the United States. And I think that's a central part of Ryan's message and a really important one. But that said, I, I, I agree with Amy that the political situation in the United States militates against us uh, embracing uh, the interdependent side of the relationship. And it really pushes us more into the competitive direction um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, one is that, as Ryan mentioned, a lot of the problems in the relationship with China, he laid uh, the responsibility for those problems, he laid at China's doorsteps. Obviously the United States is a, is a partner in the relationship and has contributed to its problems, but really over the last, six, seven years, and maybe even back to 2008, China really was, took a, took a turn that was really a woeful turn from the perspective of both American business and also from, from, from the American society. And so I think the politics in the United States right now really push against the, the possibility of embracing interdependence. And, and back to Amy's point, I think we're gonna be basically managing the competitive nature of the relationship. Secondly, in Beijing, I think you have this triumphalist feeling in, in, in China right now. They, they really very handily dealt with COVID. Uh, their economy is, continues to grow. Yes, they have a series of long-term problems, which Ryan really eloquently pointed out, but, but there's a triumphalist sense in Beijing right now that doesn't really push them to want to or feel that they need to cooperate with the United States, both in terms of domestic policy and their economic policy, but also in terms of their foreign affairs. So Ryan, let me pick up on a, on a point that, that John um, emphasized, and that is kind of your, your, your um, soundbite, you know, China's not 10 feet tall, and that we tend in the United States to overestimate the strengths of our adversaries. And for me personally, having worked with Japan during the trade wars of the 80s and the 90s, I mean, it really brought that home, but we also underestimate our strengths. 
So could you elaborate a bit more here um, and, and how this calculation kind of affects policy? Sure, well, um, it's th thank you to, to all of you for your kind comments about the book. I greatly appreciate it. Uh, it means a lot to me. Um, and I also, I would love to put a, a question on the table for John as the conversation progresses if, if we have time. I, I was asked last night um, to talk about how the US-China relationship has developed over the past 20 years. And it forced me to re reflect, do a little quick math. Uh, 2001 is 20 years ago. Uh, the situation that we had in 2001 was remarkably different than the one that we have now. And other, in, in certain respects, it sort of feels like opposite sides of the same coin. There That's a, when China joined the WTO. Exactly, China joined the WTO. President Clinton was talking about uh, the liberalizing forces of China's you know, economic integration into the international system. And there was, you know, just sort of a, a heady feeling that things were going to be moving in a, a direction that led in the direction of our interests and our values. And now, you know, we find ourselves 20 years later uh, with a high degree of pessimism about uh, the U.S.-China relationship, a high degree of skepticism about China, the direction it's taking, the path that it's on. And it made me think about John's book. Uh, because one of the themes in John's book is that uh, the history of U.S.-China relations has been this oscillation between hope and disappointment, hope and disappointment, and whether or not uh, we've reached a terminal state of, of disappointment or whether or not there are future oscillations in store. Part of the reason I say that is that if I were writing a, a book today that tried to capture this moment on May 5th, 2021, I wouldn't have written uh, the book that I did. I'm trying to write a book about the future of, of the U.S.-China relationship. And, uh, you know, it's so easy for us to take a snapshot and pretend that it's a movie. A snapshot is just a snapshot. Uh, the United States has changed considerably. China has changed considerably. But there's no evidence that leads me to the conclusion that China is on an inalterable path that will never change uh, into the future. Because we've seen this, you know, from, from Tiananmen to reform and opening, from uh, you know, th there have been so many shifts uh, and turns in, in China's conduct and American conduct that we shouldn't allow ourselves to be too captured by the, the moment we find ourselves in. But Wendy, to, to get to your specific question, that the 10 feet tall syndrome, I'm not sure what the origin of the concept is. Uh, I, I was told that it, hap it began during the Cold War, but I was on, in a conversation with John Negroponte recently. He said, no, 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 we talked about that during Vietnam, about the Viet Cong. So, I, I will leave to historians where the idea came from, but the concept is that uh, we have a tendency to view our adversaries as figures of towering strength and, and sort of immense ability to predict and anticipate and act on the future. Uh, this is a habit that the United States has for, for our challengers or competitors. Um, and part of it is healthy, uh, but if you overcrank, it becomes unhealthy uh, because it becomes a advertisement of our own insecurities. And it causes our allies and partners to question whether we know something about China that they don't, whether we know something about our own vulnerabilities that they don't. But it also causes us to become you know, reactive and anxious to every Chinese action and initiative that's taking place around the world, which causes us to, to sort of be defensive about what China's doing rather than having the initiative ourselves for advancing our own principles and our own vision for where we want to take uh, the relationship. I think we're in a much stronger position when we have initiative, when China is responding to us rather than the reverse. And I think we have a lot more attraction uh, to our allies and partners when we have confidence uh, and when we have sort of a theory of the case. The more steady we are, the more confident we are, the more we're going to be able to attract partners to our side. The more that we can attract partners to our side, the stronger position we'll find ourselves in over the long term for this long term competition with China. Maybe we can move then to this allies and partners theme. And here I want to take a theme you just mentioned vis-a-vis -vis China history, and that is hope and disappointment. I mean, we put a lot of um, you know, weight now on working with our allies and partners as the way forward to influence Chinese behavior. And you know, as someone who's worked with our allies and partners on issues through the years, um, yeah, hope and disappointment, I think, would characterize um, some of the experiences I had. Um, but Amy, maybe I'll, I'll turn to you. Um, in working with our allies and partners, you know, we're seeing a mix, okay? We're seeing some really incredible um, um, groupings of countries doing things, working on an affirmative agenda like the Quad Leaders. But we're also seeing certain countries like Korea, New Zealand, and others a little 
you know, let's just say gun shy in terms of aligning themselves too closely with the United States and others. So in, in you know, in, in going forward and working with our allies and partners, what should we be focusing on and what should we be avoiding? What should we be asking them to do and what should we not be asking them to do? Well, I, I fully agree that the U.S. Uh, risks turning off our partners and allies on China policy coordination if we set unrealistic goals or expect others to view China, <clears throat> excuse me, exactly as we do. I thought it was helpful that we heard explicit uh, references recently from Secretary Blinken and, uh, and Jake Sullivan about what we're not asking others to do in concert with us. And that is not asking any country to choose sides between the US and China. I think Brian makes this point uh, very well in the book and it's incredibly important as we've seen and heard and I think felt over the past few months to your question, Wendy, many countries don't wanna be put in that position of needing to defend their support for working with the US or working with China with one another. The US is in the midst of a, a course correction from unilateral policies on China and so this is the process of enlisting old friends and new ones, and it's a little bit harder than it probably needed to be. But as, it's, as is obvious from the reluctance of some, there is skepticism still about US long-term intentions and the ability to maintain the current policy trajectory that the administration needs to, to, to deal with head on. As Ryan, argued, I think, in Stronger, and we heard, I actually was tuned into listening to Catherine Tai this morning, and one thing that she said was to remind our allies and partners that U.S.-China relations is best managed through their active participation because the relationship has global consequences. China under Xi Jinping is a revisionist power, and it's the responsibility of us bilaterally, and in some cases multilaterally, to decide where, whether, how, both to accommodate some and push back on other Chinese ambitions on the global stage. So what I appreciate hearing from US officials talking about this question of trying to find how and what they, they discuss with our allies about China policy is that the US government doesn't want a cold war with China. It doesn't want to contain or thwart China's rise. What we want is for China to continue to integrate itself on the global stage in ways that don't unfairly disadvantage others. And I think that's why, Wendy, we saw the EU proposing legislation to block Chinese back, state-backed acquisitions of companies in Europe. I think that's why uh, Catherine Tai repeatedly highlights the necessity of considering the impact of trade policies on American workers. The Chinese government is gonna be hearing more about these policies and we have to be ready to, to, to receive more pushback from China when we're talking with our allies and partners about these concerns, but also saying we can work together too. Wendy, could I, could I ask a question though, I, I, to, to Amy's point and also to Ryan's point. Uh, Ryan, in your book, you stress that the United States should not turn China into an adversary and, and that sort of dovetails with what Amy just said. But do you think that China, but from China's perspective, aren't we already China's adversary from their perspective? And, and I mean, if you look at their activity around the world, both domestically and also in Hong Kong, increasing pressure on Taiwan. I mean, it's now that was, a, was the cover of the, the Economist this week, most dangerous place in the world. Um, and in terms of their, their um, competitive view of the United States, aren't we already their adversary? And in that type of situation, when America wants to play, for example, win-win, and the Chinese often have a tendency of looking at every issue as zero sum, it makes it difficult for us to kind of manage that relationship when they're already, it, it seems to be, from my perspective, moving in the direction of embracing a Cold War with us, whereas we're still, we've yet to make our decision on that. Um, that's something I, 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 I'm troubled by, and I, have, I come with it with more questions than answers, but I, 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 I want to throw that out to both of you. Sorry, Wendy. I sort of... No, no, Ryan, why don't you um, respond to that? And then, John, I've got a question for you. 
Well, I'll, I'll offer a, a brief response, but I hope that Wendy will, will add on to it. Um, look, my, my view, John, uh, having participated in meetings between our presidents, uh, 10 or 12 of them being in the embassy in Beijing from 2008 to 2012, yes, the, the relationship is intensely competitive and the Chinese behind closed doors aren't shy uh, about being, uh, you know, sort of blunt about uh, how, how uh, how strong they see the sharpness in, in uh, our interest. But that isn't, you know, we, diplomacy isn't guided by schoolyard, um, you know, sort of mantras that if, if he doesn't like me, I'm not going to like him. It's guided by what best advances our interest. And the, the argument that I'm trying to make is that, that, that yes, China has a, a very hostile view towards many U.S. actions. Um, but if we were to reciprocate, what would we gain? Will it put us in a stronger position? Will it generate results? My argument is that doing that will repel rather than attract our partners um, because there just aren't any other countries that, that have that same type of uh, a relationship. Even Japan uh, is uncomfortable moving in that direction. Taiwan, you mentioned, they're not on board with that. So there isn't a country in the world that would uh, find comfort uh, in us going down that path. And as a consequence, every issue would turn into a U.S.-China contest of wills, uh, you know, this great power uh, collision. And it would lead us to unproductive places uh, that aren't going to advance our interests. My, my argument is that um, getting an affirmative view of what it is that we're trying to advance rather than a constantly negative view will do better at bringing others along with us over time. It's going to take patience and persistence, um, but over time it will. It'll allow us to attract partners, which in the end will put us in a stronger position to compete with China over the long term. Our, our friends, our partners, our allies are a competitive advantage that we enjoy and China does not, uh, and, and we should nurture it. But Amy, over to you. Just specifically on the trade relationship, John, I guess I would also add, while China does have these great ambitions to, of, of course, build self-sufficiency across its economy to reduce vulnerability to U.S. policies, they're not there yet. And so even publicly, they can't fully embrace trying to decouple the, the, the interconnectedness of our trade and investment relationship because the Chinese government still explicitly says they need it. They need it in the short term. Now, yes, I agree with you, longer term thinking. I think all of our clients are thinking about whether and how they will still be able to grow in the China market seven years from now, five years from now. Uh, we can't uh, forget, as you're suggesting, John, that the Chinese government is trying to suggest a different model that is less interdependent in many ways, but they can't achieve it. Um, so a lot of, I think, some of this 10-foot tall syndrome that we, that we sometimes fall into looking at China is what it says it wants to achieve and what its economic development goals are. They're not realistic across the board. And so we do have to be hashing through where are there opportunities to really come back to the interdependence of our two economies in a positive way as we're dealing with so many more issues that are not positive, that are very competitive and difficult. Um, maybe we can just go back to this kind of allies and partners and, and a, a theme in Ryan's book, I think, was we can't really change China's behavior. They're on their own tra trajectory, but maybe we can influence it. And I think what the Biden administration would say is the best way to influence this, their behavior would be in, in um, close coordination with our allies and partners. Um, John, do you do you buy into that? Do you think that we have the ability to influence China's behavior, or, you know, do you think that they just have they're so overconfident now they view they're rising, we're falling, and therefore time is on their side? That's a great question. I, I completely agree with Ryan's view that we need to approach China embedded in our alliances, and I've always been a proponent of that idea. I think it's been the it creates the healthiest the relationship. Whether that is actually going to, um, to use the phrase that's been used for the last 40 years, shape China's rise, I think is, a, is, a, is still an open question, but I think the only way to approach China is with our friends and our partners. Um, when we do it independently, when we do things like overfly Japan in order to have a state visit with China and diss our allies, I think it's a mistake. 
Um, but whether it will ultimately end up in succeeding in, in, in shaping China's uh, choices, I think that's up to the Chinese to decide. But I think that's the only way to approach the country because we need to do it with our, with our homies as it were. So I think the, the support for the growth of the Quad, closer relations with India, um, continued strong relations with South Korea despite its political problems and obviously embedding um, our China relationship with a close relationship with Japan and with NATO as well, I think is the only way forward. So I completely agree. But whether it's going to succeed or not, back to Amy and Ryan's point, is it's still a very much an open question, specifically given the domestic issues in China happening now. Yeah, I mean, my understanding is just yesterday in the G7 meeting in the UK, two hours were spent um, of their meetings, which is a sizable chunk um, of time on the China challenge. And this is going to be a focus for the for the UK leaders meeting um, come come June. Maybe we can just move to something more specific to this audience. And that's the issue of tariffs. OK, we've got tariffs remain in place and about three on about three hundred seventy billion dollars worth of Chinese imports, most at twenty five percent, some at seven point five percent. China's got tariffs on $110 billion worth of US imports into China. The US business community is just pushing the administration to lift those tariffs right away. Um, and, you know, Catherine Tai has been on the record saying that, you know, this is something we're studying along with Tony Blinken and others as part of our review. But Catherine's also said, and, you know, and I get this as a former trade negotiator, that this is potential leverage. But my question for, for this group is, is this really leverage? Are we overestimating the leverage we have with these tariffs? And the reason I ask this is even with all of these tariffs in place, you know, we, we succeeded in, in the phase one trade agreement, which, you know, frankly did not address a lot of the core issues we sought to address when we went into that negotiation. So, and I'd also ask, has China really kind of accepted the cost of doing business with us? And that means tariffs. So therefore they're not really that um, fixated on lifting the tariffs. Or, and I just wanna raise another possibility is that these tariffs are really bothering China, but they know if they make a big deal of them then the Biden administration may think they have a lot of leverage and so therefore China's trying to underplay um, the, the hurt the tariffs are um, inflicting on the Chinese economy. Who'd like to take that one? <laughs> I'll, I'll take a first stab at it, Wendy, mainly in violent agreement with some of your points there. Um, I, I would say that of course, uh, any trade negotiator wouldn't give up chits, right? Uh, from, from the get go. And so Ambassador Tai is well, uh, well positioned to give uh, tariff relief when the US gets something. We all know there's domestic pressure on this administration. And so just not thinking about tariffs in terms of what are we gonna get for lifting them is, is, is I think not politically realistic in Washington right now. But I do think you know what we need to remember and I think my clients are saying it constantly is of course, we're suffering from China's retaliatory tariffs. China has options to buy from others, not unlimited options as they continue to damage their own diplomatic relationships with other countries. But these tariffs do need to be addressed. I think the Chinese government would agree with that. And I think our government would, would agree with it because it's a tax, it's, 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 it's costing uh, our consumers uh, and, and, and it's, un, it's unfair. The problem is, you know, just to your point, Wendy, how do you start this conversation with China? I, Ambassador Tai this morning in giving public re remarks wasn't willing to say how they were going to start. She just said again, what we've heard before that they are looking at the phase one trade agreement and all of it and trying to think, how do we continue? Of course, we want to continue with what used to be referred to as the phase two sets of issues, the really thorny structural issues that are undermining not just American investors in China, but other countries. And so those issues are ripe for coordination with others. But we have to get our house in order with the tariffs first. And so I do think it at least gives us something to start to talk about with China 
but we need to see some progress. I don't think we're going to ignore them and leave them in place forever. But as you know, from your experience, it's pretty tough to get rid of tariffs once they're put in place. Ryan, I can turn to you. It does appear that the Biden administration is kind of in no rush to engage with China or to you know, really address these issues like tariffs or um, technology related sanctions and that their China policy is more about working with allies and partners than working with China. Is this driving Beijing crazy? Well, I, it's an interesting question. And I, Wendy, I hope if we have time that you can offer your views on, on the tariff question. Um, but even if we run out of time, I just wanna make a public service announcement for an article that you wrote in Bloomberg last week, which I think lays out very clearly what options are available to the United States to address this tariff question that you raised. Um, on on the, the issue of Beijing's views of the Biden administration, you know, let's, let's take a step back uh, and think about what they were saying in December, January, and November last year. Uh, Xi Jinping was saying that time and momentum are on China's side. There was a lot of talk about the East is rising, the West is declining, right? That was the backdrop for the uh, arrival of the Biden administration. And what's happened in the past 100 days, uh, there's been a dramatic turnaround in, uh, in our COVID response. Uh, the United States is really poised to be the world leader on, on a lot of these vaccine issues. Uh, we're in the process right now of vaccinating our people, but we will quick, quickly turn to being, I think, a real sort of uh, important player on vaccinating the rest of the world. Uh, the economy is roaring back to life. Uh, if IMF forecasts can be trusted, we will be the leading growth engine of the world economy this year. Um, so alliance relationships are being repaired. America has returned to being the leading convening power in the world. Uh, in just 100 days, we've gone from being a pariah on climate issues to leading and uh, you know, galvanizing a global response to, to climate change. And I think the Chinese are asking, how did that happen? How did that happen so quickly? Uh, because it defies the, the narrative that they had grown so comfortable uh, presenting about the United States. In, in early January, I wrote that the most effective thing the, that the Biden administration could do would be to restore itself at home and repair its alliances abroad. Uh, that will set us in a stronger position to deal with China over time. I think that's essentially the, the playbook that uh, the Biden administration is running. They're not you know, trying to put China into angry isolation into perpetuity. They're trying to put ourselves in a stronger position to re-engage from China. And I, I expect that in the coming months and years that we will see that play out. And yet, John, China keeps asking for a resumption of dialogues and more meetings. Um, do you think they're sincere about that? Generally speaking, yes. And I actually also think that we really haven't put China in an icebox. Um, we had the wonderful meeting in Alaska. And to Ryan's point, there was a lot of histrionics publicly for the cameras, but there was also eight hours of meetings in a, in a room with no windows. And in addition, John Kerry did go to China to talk about climate change. Um, and I thought actually he was remarkably, um, what's the word, mature about, about ensuring that the climate change issues didn't bleed into broader policy issues, which the Chinese want to do. They want to pull climate change into the larger basket of US-China relations in order to try to get benefits in basket A for their cooperation on climate change. And I thought he was remarkably, um, uh, like I said, mature about that as well. So I think that under the surface, there is a lot going on between the two countries, but it's just not politically viable for the Biden administration to be announcing that as well. Can I just offer one, one quick addition? To, I think John makes a great point. There is a certain benefit to both leaders to having a, a manageable degree of friction in the relationship. Right, Xi Jinping, uh, it's, it, as long as the level of friction is manageable, it helps to make the case for why China needs to struggle. It feeds into the nationalist machine, the nationalism machine that is running hot uh, in China right now. And in the United States, you know, we've seen President Biden um, uh, invoke China as the need for us to take action on certain issues, whether it's infrastructure or building back better more broadly. So. If, if both leaders have confidence that they can manage the friction, uh, I think that they both see a certain value in, in allowing it to run a little bit. And my sense is that both Joe Biden and Xi Jinping have a pretty high degree of confidence in their ability together uh, to manage the relationship and avoid it from tilting into you know, a spiraling escalation. I, I want to emphasize that I completely agree with Ryan on that. And specifically next year, Xi Jinping will be 
basically asking the Central Committee to approve an unprecedented third term as the General Secretary of the Chinese Communist Party. There's no indication that he really faces significant blowback from anyone. But that said, it's really an unprecedented move for somebody like him to, to declare themselves basically the president and the party secretary for life. And that's, that's going to be an interesting uh, moment in time for China politically. And I think increasing friction around China's borders plays into his narrative that they need him to continue the leadership of the Communist Party of China. If I could just add to what you're saying, John, but it, it really puts uh, Xi Jinping in a precarious position too, uh, because if an accident spirals out of control or if uh, China is unsuccessful in working with the United States on, on any specific initiative, it's gonna look weak. And so I do think, uh, I think Brian was saying, you know, this idea of They'll, they will eventually, they, the two uh, leaders of our countries, will deal with the relationship on their own terms does seem to be the safer course. Where I think that there are stakeholders uh, in Washington who don't want to kick things down the road. And so we haven't mentioned the role of Congress yet, but clearly uh, that is influencing how much um, uh, Xi Jinping and Joe Biden are going to be able to manage the timetable of engagement and dealing with thorny issues. There's a lot of pressure, I think, on Joe Biden to start to address these issues. And we've heard it from Secretary Blinken on this values-based policy that forces Xi Jinping to react in a way I think is very uncomfortable. Wendy? Ken, I'm gonna turn it over to you then for um, questions from viewers. I see we have a lot of them piling up. We, we do indeed. Thank you. Um, can keep the conversation going. Um, I mentioned to our speakers before we got started, I wanted this to feel like uh, the, the four of them were having uh, drinks at, at the Willard Hotel talking about China policy and the rest of us were eavesdropping on the conversation. So I feel like I'm pushing my chair into the table and saying some of the things that we're hearing from around the room. Um, you know, thinking of the values, Amy, that you were just talking about, um, several of the questions uh, came in about Taiwan, um, how we deal with the issue of Taiwan. Um, it seems to be um, percolating higher up on the uh, for the Biden administration. They're talking about it more than we'd heard in recent years. Um, and our dear friend uh, Jim Colby uh, wants to put on the table. You know, how do we deal with some of those friction issues that are ca you know causing problems for on our values front related to Hong Kong, the treatment of the Uyghurs. You know, how, how do we in your in your concept, Ryan, of competitive interdependence, how do we how do we deal with some of these issues? Well, it's it's a great question. Um, you know, on Taiwan, it has generated a lot of attention recently as an issue as alarm has risen about the risk of conflict. Uh, I, I am of the view that the, the risk of conflict is probably less than is being discussed publicly. But the challenge posed by China's ongoing active coercion of Taiwan is greater uh, than is being publicly recognized. In other words, I think that what Beijing is trying to do is create a sense of psychological vulnerability in Taiwan to encourage the people of Taiwan to feel like they are alone, isolated to deal with China, and that, uh, and that their only path over the long term to peace and prosperity is to welcome the embrace of China. And I worry sometimes that uh, the amount of attention that is being devoted to a, a low risk scenario uh, heightens that sense of vulnerability without offering any solutions to the vulnerabilities that Taiwan's facing. So my hope is that over time, we will begin to focus within the bounds of existing policy on the real things that we can do to help the people of Taiwan feel more comfortable and confident in their future. And I think there are things that we can do. We can help them feel greater dignity and respect on the world stage, create opportunities for them to be solutions providers for many of the problems that we're all grappling with, whether it's green technology or women's empowerment or, or pandemic preparedness. I mean, Taiwan is a world leader uh, in many of these areas and they have a lot to offer. I think that we, we have uh, a responsibility to take a hard look at whether or not there's more that we can do to help Taiwan increase its economic diversification so that it doesn't feel reliant upon the mainland economy. And I hope over time the, that Wendy's former colleagues at USTR will, uh, will give that an, a fresh look. And then I, I also think that uh, there's a lot that we can do with Taiwan to help ensure that they remain at the leading edge of innovation uh, as they are in semiconductors right now, um, because that's, that's important for them, it's important for us. 
Uh, so I, I hope that as we move forward, we'll begin to focus on helping Taiwan, um, you know, build on its own existing strengths. If I can just add, I, I, just to echo what Ryan was saying, I think we really need to look for ways to strengthen and kind of upgrade our economic relationship with Taiwan. But I don't think we should be pursuing, uh, you know, a bilateral trade agreement, a free trade agreement with them. I don't think that's in the cards. We're not doing, you know, that's not the Biden trade policy right now. But what can we do short of a free trade agreement? And here, I think there are many different sectors where we have overlining and uh, over, overlapping interests, commonalities, and frankly, you know, in areas like digital, medical supply chains, semiconductors. Um, and I think we really should be looking at these areas and really kind of upgrade our overall relationship with China. And I would advocate that it's time to kind of put this TIFA side um, and really come up with kind of a new kind of framing mechanism for US Taiwan economic cooperation on trade and broader economic issues. Well, yeah. please, Sorry. please, Amy. Go ahead. Excuse me, Ken, just to uh, reinforce it, certainly sounded like Ambassador Tai has embraced that view, Wendy, just this morning in talking about this issue, saying, let's not get, a, you know, stay focused on TIFA, FTA, let's talk, let's get creative in how we can expand uh, economic cooperation. Well, I'll admit, I did not listen to her comments so, this morning, uh, but so I, you were I, I echo them. Spot on, <laughs> spot on how she's viewing these issues in response to a question about that, that topic. So in keeping with that, and, and I know um, at least a couple of people on this session had something to do with the Trans-Pacific Partnership um, at various stages of its, its uh, negotiation. Obviously, it's not something that's uh, front of mind for the Biden administration, but it was designed initially with China in mind. And uh, you were just talking about, and that's, we've had a few questions about TPP in the questions, you know, are there things short of a region-wide trade agreements that we could do both with our allies in the region that might not include China, but then other things with China that maybe we should be pursuing on the trade front, the environmental front. You know, you've mentioned a few of those in this session. Are there some things concrete that we should be looking at over the next few years? Ryan? Well, I'll, I'll offer a, a quick thought, but Wendy's trained me never to step in front of her on, on issues uh, that relate to TPP. So uh, my, my instincts will limit me here. But uh, look, I think that the big gap in our Asia policy at the moment is that we don't have a competitive offering for the issue that matters most to the people in the region, which is economic mobility. Um, and this is a real handicap for us. So I don't expect that the political dynamics are going to shift in the United States anytime soon to sort of open the aperture for reconsideration of, of CPTPP, but that shouldn't, it shouldn't be a, a all or nothing proposition. Uh, I think that we are going to have to just by force of necessity take an a la carte approach to making progress where progress is possible. And I think that there's space to do good work on, on digital trade, potentially environmental services. Um, and I hope that as we move towards November with uh, President Biden's first expected trip to the region, uh, that, that these issues will, will come into sharper focus and that we'll be able to, to have uh, an offering of our own. I mean, I would just add, we could, be, we could do everything right in the region, but if we don't have some trade initiatives or broader economic initiatives, we're not going to succeed. In many respects, that's what many Asian countries are looking to us for. And I think we need to, to take the word that Amy used this morning and the, that Ambassador Tai did. We need to be creative. We need to recognize, okay, we have constraints. We're not gonna be doing a big trade agreement with these countries that's not in the cards right now. But what can we do short of that? Um, whether it be in digital trade, medical supply chains, broader supply chains, climate and trade, COVID related issues. And then how can we build on that over time? And maybe as we go forward with sectoral initiatives, we find ourselves kind of headed towards something that is bigger, where there is the needed domestic support, um, you know, to, to, to help bring these agreements over the finish line. So um, I think there's a lot we can do in the region, but I think every month we're not coming forward with something, we're losing valuable time. 
RCEP is going to come into fruition probably the first quarter of 2022. Four countries now in the region have ratified it. CPTPP is now over two years in effect with the UK formally starting accession um, you know, procedures. And you know, who knows, China's expressed an interest and I think many of us think they're not ready, but I don't think the story's over there on what China might seek um, with respect to CPTPP. So interesting, because you know, I always thought of the original TPP as both carrots and sticks as related to China. Um, and it sounds like they're nibbling at the carrots right now. But, oh, Ryan, did you want to jump in for a second? Well, I, I was just going to say, I think Wendy raised an important point. You know, what part of what China, China recognizes that they don't meet the criteria for entering into TPP. And uh, the fact that they are nevertheless voicing their ambition over time to, to enter TPP, it, it helps draw a contrast that China prefers, that they are invested in the region, that the United States is distant and unreliable. But it also helps, you know, seed a narrative that uh, that that China is the future, that China is going to be the center, and the United States is going to be out in outer orbit, you know, bickering with itself over its own domestic politics. This isn't good for us. Um, so, I, I understand where we are in the United States at the moment, but I hope that uh, sooner and later our interests can guide us to a better place. So let me ask you a question, sort of. I'm almost thinking of like a, a schoolyard here um, or, you know, high school, um, you know, and I don't mean to belittle what the issue question I'm going to raise, it's Australia. Um, China's trying to silence foreign critics. Um, they get, they're very, very sensitive to critics overseas. And they're even talked about using, I saw one article criticizing uh, Adrian Zenz, who speaks about the Uyghurs, uh, using uh, the legal mechanisms as almost a form of warfare. Um, lawfare, I think they called it, in a, in a Chinese arm. You know, what do we do about that sort of extraterritorial reach that they're trying to do? They're, they're, you know, Australia is a member of RCEP, a member of TPP, and they're still sanctioning them over, you know, cr criticisms. You know, what, what do we do with an ally in that, in that situation? John? Uh, I think we do what we're trying to do with Australia is back them. Completely. Uh, Kurt Campbell has made several pronouncements saying that we have Australia's back on this issue. Uh, in addition, we have to push back as, strong, as strongly as possible on issues like the national security law in Hong Kong, which seems to have global implications. So if I'm in Berkeley, California, basically lobbying on behalf of quote unquote Hong Kong independence, I could be charged and prosecuted if I return to Hong Kong on a business trip. Um, so these type of issues, I think, are, are extremely important in terms of trying to push back with our allies um, and for our allies against Chinese overreach. Uh, and I think this is going to be an increasing issue in the future as China attempts to continue to with using concentric circles to expand its influence, not simply in the physical space, but also in the Internet space and in the ide ideological space as well. I think this is a major challenge for our system of values going forward. And just to put a footnote on that, it's an immediate challenge for our companies who are trying to operate in the China market because there is this, I think, proliferation right now of self-defensive me defensive mechanisms that can address what the Chinese call our extraterritoriality, the sanctions that we've imposed and other measures. And so we know that the Chinese government wants to have more options for retaliating against any policies that are critical uh, of Chinese priorities. And so I agree with John, you know, on how Australia is being treated. We, the United States, have to be strong and vocally supporting Australia. But we also have to be prepared that this is going to affect our companies too on the ground in China who are operating there. Definitely. I mean, we have, you know, two long term held uh, Canadian hostage. We have a Chinese, a, a Chinese ethnic Chinese reporter who's an Australian national held by China, who is who meets with the uh, the Chinese uh, Australian consular officials with a bag over her head um, in Chinese custody. I mean, this this could easily be moved to an American businessman as well. Um, so we really need to be prepared for that type of potential. And and not to put too fine a point on it as well, um, they're threatening to prosecute members of the Danish parliament 
elected members of their government for inviting a Hong Kong dissident to speak in Denmark, who then subsequently sought asylum, I believe, in, in the UK. So, you know, or any US government officials at risk, uh, you know, I'm putting that in air quotes, um, uh, of, of Chinese uh, extraterritorial reach of their legal system. Um, well, you know, look, there were so many, uh, there were literally, there are still 10 questions we didn't get to. I am very sorry to our audience for not getting to those. I will forward those to Ryan and Wendy, uh, Amy and John, so they can see those questions. And if there's anything they want to personally engage on, um, they'll have that information. Thank you uh, to the four of you. Really grateful for having you on the WIDA platform. This is too short a conversation. I think we need to get another drink um, in that uh, 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 virtual bar that we're in um, and, and talk about this some more. Um, we had the idea suggested that we should have you all back again next year um, to see where we are at with this relationship and, and uh, what progress has been made or steps back, hopefully not in the months to come. So thank you all for joining us. Thanks to our audience for being with us today. Uh, really grateful to all of you. Everybody who's watching this, take care of yourself, take care of everybody around you, and please get the shot when you're able to. Thanks. Thank you.